Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Future Cities. I'm your host, Stephen Elser. If you're just joining for the first time, I'm an environmental life sciences PhD candidate at Arizona State University. In today's episode, we'll be discussing how one company is trying to create affordable, smart communities in countries across the world. One of the greatest challenges for city living is the cost of housing. You've no doubt heard or experienced some of the astronomical prices in places like New York City or San Francisco, where on average, renting an apartment could cost you about 4,000 US dollars a month. Of course, it's not just these coastal hubs where you'll see high rents. In virtually every city, you'll see more and more luxury apartments being built with high rent, um, with less attention being paid to affordable housing options. This is obviously more of an issue for low-income residents who will struggle to find a more affordable housing that has desirable amenities or is in a desirable location. So how do we go about creating communities in our cities that are both affordable and desirable? Well, today I'll be speaking with Alan Marcus, who is the Chief Digital Strategy Officer of Planet Smart City. Planet Smart City is a company that aims to tackle the global housing crisis by building smart, affordable cities and neighborhoods in countries across the world. Without further ado, here's our conversation. Yes, uh, I'm Alan Marcus, and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Planet Smart City. Uh, we are a startup based in, uh, in Europe. Uh, working in Brazil, uh, India, in addition to Europe, focused on uh, building affordable smart cities. About the last, uh, well, year I've been in this position. Before that, I spent uh, 10 years at the World Economic Forum. Um, prior to that, uh, 25 years or so in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley tech-related businesses. I bring that up because going from the tech environment you know, where I was building internet uh, technology, uh, infrastructure backbone kind of technology into uh, the World Economic Forum, I started to recognize uh, a need not particularly for technology, but a need to balance technology, profit making and business with social environmental impact. Uh, And in my 10 years at the forum, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, policy issues and a structural uh, norms and challenges that are creating more uh, uh, or more negative impact than positive impact and finding ways of bringing business and government and other social leaders together to think in terms of, of positive impact uh, direction. So really starting to recognize that you can be a completely profitable, uh, you know, uh, capitalized company but still have very positive impacts on society. Um, And to do really good, solid impacts on society, you need some kind of funding, some kind of profitable mechanism. So how you marry the two and create a policy framework over it made me think that the next role I wanna have is to actually practice that, not just talk about it or think about it in terms of of a macro set of conditions, but actually get into a a particular company and and drive that opportunity. So while I was looking, here came along this this wonderful little startup that had exactly that kind of dream. Now, I don't know anything about real estate and development, but I know a lot about tech and policy. And so uh, the opportunity presented itself where they wanted to change the way they approached building uh, infrastructure and uh, communities not just in the smart city way, but really in an overall more digitally forward looking way. And so I said, here, I, I, I would love to do that. So I'm learning a lot about real estate development and I'm able to bring my, my technology and policy background into uh, looking at impact, uh, both uh, social and environmental impact and, and how we can uh, balance between the two in driving our company forward. Awesome, thank you so much. So, uh- it's right there in the name of the company, um, Planet Smart City. Could you just tell us what is a smart city? Well, I mean, that's, that's really the biggest question of all, isn't it? Uh, you know, the, the challenge I see in, uh, in the world uh, in smart city thinking is no matter who you ask, you'll get some different kind of, uh, of definition. Um, everyone's got their own uh, take on it. Um, And I guess we're not much different in that respect. Um, For us, though, SMART is really about 
thinking in terms of services and how people engage in a community level. Um, we think that's where smart starts, that it's not about the technology. It's not about how big or small a city is. It's not about thinking in terms of, you know, how I can build better connections or better widgets or whatnot. It, it really starts simply by recognizing the need of a community and, and how individuals engage in such a community. And then what are those services that are unique and opportunistic for that community uh, to thrive? And thrive not just uh, economically, thrive socially, thrive environmentally. So for us, that, that's what we mean by smart. And um, I'll use that term community a lot I, in, in, uh, in the way I explain things, because although the, uh, the topic might be smart city and people think in terms of, of that term, for us, it, it really means starting at the community level. It could be a, a neighborhood within a uh, in a large city. It could be a small town on the outskirts. It could be a you know a standalone mid-sized town. But it, it's it's where people engage in a in a set of common uh, needs and common desires. And and how they engage is what really turns us into into a community. So there's a community of purpose and a community of interest that kind of forms within that uh, geographical framework. Um, so for us, SMART is really uh, staying attuned to those needs and uh, enabling them uh, through uh, technology and other services uh, to, to help them attain those goals. Thank you. That was a great answer. I, I suspected that the answer might be that, well, everyone sort of has a different take on it, as that's the, that's the case with a lot of the terms that I, that I use and my, our, our research network uses. So like resilience, green infrastructure, things like that, depending on who you're talking to and where you are, people have yes. totally different definitions of what that means. So I think it's, yeah, it's important just to lay out what we mean right now in this conversation when we say smart city. So great. Thank of you so course. much. So could you give us an example um, or some examples of the sorts of projects that Planet Smart City works on, maybe from like smaller scale to larger scale, just to give people an idea of the breadth uh, at which you work? Yeah, so uh, from the small scale, well, maybe I'll say it like this, actually. Um, you know, we think in terms of greenfield and brownfield, greenfield meaning, you know, brand new construction, uh, brand new infrastructure, brownfield, you know, standard renovation, we're building within existing infrastructure uh, space. And then we think in terms of vertical, you know, high rises, mid rises, high rises, tower type uh, of, of housing. And we think in terms of horizontal, you know, actual homes uh, with gardens, uh, houses with gardens. Um, so from the kind of horizontal, um, we're looking at projects that run between, you know, uh, uh, communities of 10,000 to about 40,000 people. Uh, that's where uh, our kind of space is in the horizontal, uh, in the greenfield uh, space. Uh, in the greenfield vertical space, we're looking anywhere from about uh, 3,000 to 50,000 um, in, in those kinds of, of uh, vertical uh, environments. In the brownfield or renovation, which we are, are doing more in Europe at the moment than we are anywhere else. Uh, there we could be looking at, you know, a thousand people to maybe 3000 people uh, types of, of communities. So that's kind of the gives you sort of a sense of the scale, the size we're looking at. Yeah, great. Thank you. So uh, sort of related to that. So you mentioned this brown fitting or retrofitting sort of existing developments to mm -hmm. sort of make them a bit smarter. So could you just describe some of the challenges of uh, of that retrofitting process, I am a renovating process. I imagine building something up from new with a particular vision in mind is maybe a little bit easier in some ways than trying to adapt something that was made, you know, maybe hundreds of years ago to, you know, fit into this vision of, of what, you know, you guys want smart to be and what the, you know, the new community values are like. Right. Um, so yes, first you're correct. Um, when one be, builds, you know, brand new, you know, green uh, from the beginning, it's there's a whole lot of things that are that are easier, um, and surprisingly, from a community standpoint, things that are actually more difficult. Um, in the brownfield or retrofit space, uh, some of the big challenges, of course, are just the infrastructure itself. So when I say infrastructure, I don't just mean you know the wiring and plumbing within a particular home or particular building. 
I mean, even the infrastructure of the environment, the urban environment or, or the, the geographical environment that that building or, or home is sitting in, um, that infrastructure is your first set of challenges. And there's some pretty old wiring and plumbing and uh, road works and things like that that aren't efficient in terms of smart and new and sustainable ways, we, you know, as we think today. Um, they made a lot of sense when they were built, like I said, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, but they may not make sense today. And so there's your first set of challenges and what can you do about them um, are, are opportunities. Within the, the buildings themselves, the first real challenge comes from the kind of equipment that's used to tap into that infrastructure. So now let's talk about some examples. Uh, there's a place in, uh, in, uh, Milan, in uh, Milan, or actually just outside of the city of Milan, um, a small a community called uh, Giardino. And they had uh, a number of, uh, of, of buildings, of apartments, and they really wanted to improve the efficiency from an energy uh, use standpoint as part of a, of a smart retrofit. Um, the challenge is that the power company and the way the power company uh, delivers that power is using you know, these old-fashioned kind of, uh, of power meters. So, okay, well, why don't we just replace them with smart meters? Well, there's a bunch of regulations and standards that kind of prevent you from doing that easily. So what you end up doing is you end up putting essentially kind of a second meter in place or some type of device that taps into the original meter, um, which comes with a whole new set of, of challenges. You know, is it reliable? Is the data being collected regularly? Is it accurate? Right. But it's the only way to get it into a format that can then be radioed or uh, transmitted in some way. Uh, to, to a place, you know, for, for data processing. So you start to see these kinds of challenges around that, that infrastructure and, and what it represents, particularly when you're starting to think in terms of, you know, energy efficiency, which is one of the first things that the brownfields start to think about. And it's not just about how do I show that I can, you know, with a smart meter, reduce my energy as an individual. It's also about how as a, as a community, we can start playing with energy use on, on a market uh, standpoint. Um, you know, particularly in Europe, but we're seeing this all over the world, you're able to, uh, you know, get discounts on your energy use by uh, creating a large reduction on demand. Um, you know, this notion of rolling brownouts is something that happens, you know, summer times now are getting extra hot in Europe, and there's not always enough power to generate, you know, for air conditioning and other needs. So they, you know, have to reduce that and, and that causes a problem. But as a community, if I have a better uh, count of how my energy is being used, I can uh, negotiate uh, in front of, of those conditions and say, look, on demand, I'm willing to take out you know, 40 kilowatt hours or, uh, or 4,000 kilowatt hours or whatever is you know, the, the capacity. And I know that because I've been tracking and watching my energy use. So I can negotiate a better price overall with that, uh, with that energy provider. And when they need that energy back, you know, on demand, I, I can effectively make that happen through through a smart connection. So these are some of the things that we're starting to look at and, and the challenges that it presents. Um, in, in terms of kind of social constructs, I think some of the, the, the benefits and opportunities in a brownfield is you typically have a community there that's operating and we're able to, to use, uh, you know, digital technology to build some efficiencies into the way they're already operating. Um, how they acquire food, um, their transportation systems, uh, access to healthcare, things of this nature, because the community's already got a set of, of activities and processes in place, we can build efficiency within that. So the challenge, of course, there is building the trust to move them from their old way of doing things to a new way. But because it follows a similar process uh, at first and then builds efficiency on top of that, you know, sometimes we, we might start off slow in a challenging way, but can accelerate uh, quickly after once we, we show that benefit. So infrastructure and, and kind of social uh, constructs in the brownfield are, are two areas that we, you know, that, that certainly present challenges and opportunities. Yeah, right. I think that point you just made about trust, I think, is really important. That's something that, as a researcher, I also experience. So I've done some work in, in other countries and, you know, developing trust with people on the ground, uh, I think, is really important. So could you actually uh, expand on that a little bit more and just talk about how 
your company goes about developing the, the trust and relationships that you need to, to succeed? Yeah. So first, uh, let me define trust in a particular way, because I think it's important. And I'm going to use my, uh, my sons as the, as the author of this definition, because it, it's really, uh, uh, I think, key in certainly the way I think and how I apply uh, my thinking into the role and, and building the trust. Um, if I go up to my sons and I, you know, I wiggle my fingers and, you know, that kind of look like I'm going to tickle you, they, uh, you know, they screech and they run. Um, and why do they do that? And uh, if I ask them, you know, well, what's wrong? I, I haven't even touched you. Yeah, but you're going to. No, no, I won't tickle you. Okay, but they're still recoiling. Well, why are you doing that? Well, because you tell me you're not going to tickle me, but I know you will anyway. So I don't trust you that you're not going to tickle me. So I bring that up as a very basic definition because for me, the real basis of trust is are you doing what you say you're going to do? And are you not doing what you say you're not going to do? And when I look at the, the digital platforms and smart technologies that's been deployed uh, in many places around the world, unfortunately, for good reasons and nefarious, nefarious ones, we're finding that sometimes what you said you were going to do is not exactly what you're doing with that technology. And what you said it wouldn't do, you're kind of doing it too. So this creates all kinds of trust barriers. For us, we start simply by uh, having a human, a person, not a technology, not an interface, but a person. We call them a community manager. It's a title uh, that we give them. They have soci uh, sociological type backgrounds, a sociologist of sorts, and they're there to really work with and appreciate and understand the needs of the community. That's, that's our very first step. Whenever we're going into any new community or we're building a community, the first person we hire before we even build that first uh, apartment or home is the community manager. And they're already talking with prospective buyers and renters. They're already talking with existing community members, both within the community and in the periphery uh, where that community might engage, you know, retail and, and other services. And we're starting to really understand who they are and what is different about them. That's the first step. The second, we build trust by doing exactly what we say. We co-design services with them. Our digital platforms and apps are a tool. They're not the product, they're, they're a tool. The product is the community as a service. That's the actual product. So these tools with the community manager start to enable the community, the individuals to uh, get access to information, to try certain things out, to see what works and what doesn't, and to build consensus over the right direction for that community. What kind of service? How do we want to use? And what kind of data are we going to share? How do we want to build value on top of that? And by running through this kind of iterative process, we're able to build trust. We're able to uh, effectively not, not get buy-in. That, that would be the wrong way to say it to get ownership of what's happening in the community to the people who live there uh, and then give them the tools that they can use to continue to drive that, that ownership in the direction they see fit. For us, this is a win-win because uh, getting access to the, to the people, being able to bring them ideas, taking their ideas and building that into a digital uh, platform allows us to bring value-added services that can generate revenue for us and generate the, the outcome that they're looking for. And as long as we continue to do that and build upon that and experiment uh, with that through discovery, we feel that that trust uh, can, can, can only grow. Now, does that mean that mistakes can't happen? No, mistakes can happen. But if mistakes are done in an open and transparent way, and we all see how and why the mistake was made, then the ability to recover that, uh, that potential breach of trust becomes much simpler. So for us in everything we do, our suppliers, um, how our internal controls work, how we're um, uh, managing uh, data, how we're looking at the technology and what it represents in the infrastructure, in the home and in the community, in every step, we're always asking ourselves, is this aligned with that trust model? Great, thank you. That was a really great explanation. 
Um, so thinking more about uh, your developments, either the the uh, brownfield or the greenfield, so the new or the renovations, uh, how do you ensure that your work is uh, future proof? Uh, so in other words, are your developments designed to be flexible so that they can easily be adapted when new technologies and challenges arise? Um, yeah, well, that's a, another very big question. You, you definitely have some uh, some big ones. <laughs> so, you know, in a utopian world, we could build some general purpose community hardware. I'll just use that term quite quite generically. I don't mean particularly computer hardware. Just just you know, physical infrastructure. Um, we can build it in 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 a very generic way, and through software, we can program it to do whatever we want to. So a building could be a home, it could be a music hall, it could be a football pitch. You know, in a utopian world, that's what you would do. Um, you know, why is Tesla so interesting, in my opinion? It's not because they've really uh, proven that electric cars can be mainstream. No, I don't think that's what makes them interesting. I think what makes them interesting is they've shown that you can build a car that's kind of future-proof. Right, that through software upgrades, you can get some of the new features which makes your car last longer. I think it makes it much more of an impact statement in that manner than it does in the fact that it's electric versus a combustible engine. I would love to be able to do something like that uh, within our communities. And we're doing it somewhat. Obviously a physical building is a physical building. It has walls. And although you can renovate and tear a wall down and build another one, I mean, that has its own set of, of environmental impact challenges and costs. But where we think we're being flexible enough is in this. Instead of building space on a per person basis where you, you talk about, uh, you know, an individual home with a set amount of space, you know, a living room, a kitchen, a bedroom, a bathroom, and so on. Um, and you try to maximize that in some way to generate value for, for the person who's going to buy or rent or you know, live in this space. What we're looking at is how can we optimize that space to the most minimum footprint we can do. And the space that's left over combine that into shared living opportunities. So, you know, to, to make it quite concrete, it just as an example, you may say, okay, so I want to build a, uh, a home and I could build it at, uh, you know, 70 square meters, or I can build it at, you know, 72 square meters. Well, we've all walked into homes, apartments and looked at it and said, oh, wow, this is a uh, uh, feels so big and it's 70 square meters and you walk into another one and it feels so small and it's 100 square meters. And why is it? It's it's how they, you know, account for space, how they built their closet, um, how, how they align the kitchen. And so there's real interesting optimization techniques that you can put into that space to maximize return in a smaller footprint. And the reason I talk about that and then taking some of that space into a common area, when you're building, you're you know, as, as, a, as a business, you've got to control costs and you're looking at your per square foot build costs and you're going to look at, well, okay, what is my total revenue I need to make to recover that cost? So my cost to build, uh, you know, a million square meters is a cost for a million square meters, whether I put that all into individual units or make the units a little bit more smaller, a little bit more optimized and build some common spaces. So my total build is exactly the same amount. With those common spaces, some shared kitchens, um, barbecues, uh, green areas, uh, uh, common uh, rooms, uh, you know, uh, community halls, these sorts of things, you can add all of these features. And then through technology, you can do things that expand the living environment of those individuals to take advantage of those common spaces you know, at a time when they need it. Um, and not and and they don't need to worry about the maintenance and the you know the costs and the taxation and the and the service around those those areas because they're not part of their home they're part of this larger community um, and that gives us some pretty flexibility in terms of future proofing the technology itself the challenges when you put some big fancy technology in it, it it's going to age there's nothing you can do. But when you don't think in terms of the technology itself, but the purpose and the process, then you can replace things pretty easily. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, one 
um, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, um, in Mazdar City, which is, you know, uh, it talked about as, as one of the first from the ground up kind of smart cities. There, there's a couple of flaws you'll see if you ever walk around there. Uh, one, it doesn't feel like a community, certainly not to me, but I would let you or anyone else make their own judge when you walk through. But from a technology standpoint, you see some really interesting flaws. They went solar everywhere, even walls, outdoor walls to collect the sun. It made a lot of sense at the time. The problem is that the, the capacity of those solar uh, panels is really uh, small because when they installed them, that was the state of the art. And it, it, the efficiency is not very good. And worse, the age and sandstorms. In fact, it's very interesting that dust in the air collects on them. And then uh, they, they get that one uh, humid or one rainy day a year. And all that dust turns into a glue and it sticks on there, makes them pretty much inoperable. It's a technology that made sense on paper, but in practice didn't. So there's one example of why uh, you have to be careful with the kind of hardware you put in there. The example of where things work more interesting, um, I can talk about how you w wire homes. So, so we look in, say, Brazil, um, one of our smart communities, uh, Laguna and Natal is another, where we're building actual houses. Um, typically at the affordable level, you want to, you know, uh, make sure your costs are quite low. And so they pull the minimum amount of copper wiring through the house just to get the basic electricity to work. By putting in one extra wire, which from a labor cost is zero, from a copper cost is like a few cents per home, we can have a control wire in every building. And what I hook into that control wire is whatever's the latest in terms of uh, smart home technology but it's a small hub. It costs maybe $20, $25. And uh, next year or two years or five years from now, there's a better one. I just pop that one out, put a new one in. It's getting the right wiring, the right layout, where the stuff goes, what are the, what are the today's opportunities and future potential opportunities for connecting into that. These are the areas that you, you, know, you, you wanna think about. So you build the right kind of infrastructure that can adapt to future technology and you future-proofed as much as you can. Of course, new things are gonna come that there was no way to envision. And that's always a challenge. It's the same challenge as retrofitting any brownfield. But I think today we're smart enough to recognize that there are some just basic things you can do that enable you to swap in and out small pieces of technology or, or hardware and yet still be able to operate around the, the basic environment that you built in the first place. Great, thank you. Uh, so thinking more about uh, the unexpected or the unknown, uh, I'm curious how your company incorporates knowledge about climate change into uh, your process. Since you know, with climate change, we expect there to be longer and more intense droughts, more frequent and more intense hurricanes and other rainstorms, and those have all sorts of ramifications for cities and the physical infrastructure, as well as, you know, the social and ecological dimensions of the city. So I'm curious, uh, yeah, to what extent the company uh, incorporates climate change knowledge into, into your planning? Well, <clears throat> of course, um, we, we are not climate change experts. Um, we, we don't employ at the moment, and it doesn't mean we will in the future, but at the moment we don't employ a climate science uh, or scientists, uh, climate science expertise. But we do uh, try to keep up with what the latest uh, you know, information is in terms of climate, you know, as it applies to the geographies in which we're, we're looking to operate. Uh, in Brazil, that includes uh, recognizing that there are uh, uh, more frequently and more um, intense rainstorms in the northeast of Brazil. Water collects on the roads. Um, you can see many roads there uh, where um, this, uh, I think it's called the substrate, right? The, 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 the road bed, not, not the actual road that you drive on, but underneath it, they call the road bed the substrate. Um, it actually washes away underneath the road. So if you start to see these waves, uh, in the road, um, you see uh, water uh, piles up or builds up on them and creates the slippery conditions, um, uh, you know, hydroplaning type conditions for vehicles. Uh, and then the more vehicles ride on them, of course, the worse things things get. 
And so you, you see that. So we're, we're looking at, you know, what the science is telling us where things are going. And then we start to think in terms of techniques that change that, that uh, uh, the formula for how, how we address it. So instead of building standard roads with substrate and a tarmac over it, which is the common way, we're actually building bricks. We actually have our own factory that builds these bricks. Um, the bricks look like individual bricks, but actually they come out of the machine in a, uh, uh, it's like a, I know, a couple meters, a four meters by a four meter square. And then we've got, you know, special equipment that lays that square down into the, uh, into the dirt. So the substrate and the road uh, surface are actually integrated into one kind of brick. And they're bricks because it allows the water to seep through them, but they're uh, stuck. Uh, um, I'm sorry, they're, they're formed in this kind of uh, four meter by four meter block that allows, uh, you know, stabilizing, right? So they don't uneven individually, since they're not laid individually, it means that the space between each and every one is identical and the machine that's laying it out is a, a doing it in, in a very robotic fashion. So you have this perfectly laid kind of a thick uh, road surface that immediately absorbs the water and channels it away during those heavy streams. And then where does it channel it? We, we build the, the channel capabilities to capture that water uh, into the lagoon, which we then have waterproof to ensure that we're not losing uh, that water through leakage or through you know, uh, additional draw off. Um, certainly you can't stop evaporation, but you can at least uh, prevent additional waters from going uh, to leaving it through, through uh, you know, streams or rivulets that, that tend to build around these types of lagoons. So these are the kinds of, of investments we start to make. And again, from a cost perspective, it's the same as the normal way of doing things. It's just you have to think about this ahead of time. For things like drought and drought areas, um, uh, obviously looking at the kinds of plant life that need a whole lot less water, but still provide the kind of, uh, of outdoor environment that makes living in a community more interesting. You know, concrete is not that interesting. Um, we're uh, doing as much uh, material manufacturing. I mentioned the bricks, but other fabrications are done on the site. So we're not having to have big trucks bring in loads of equipment. Um, so we're really looking at even in the whole supply chain, how do we account for uh, all of our carbon emissions? So we're doing lots of these things. These are not revolutionary by any means. These are things that we've learned from watching lots of other people. Um, but it's in important that we you know do it throughout every part of, of our building our infrastructure or how home building and then uh, how we can service our our community residents as well so uh, as i was preparing for this conversation i looked around the planet smart city website and you know saw mm -hmm. some of the projects that your company has been working on and the communities that you help to develop they look beautiful and technological and modern but they also look expensive. But, you know, one of the core mm -hmm. values of your company is to provide affordable housing. So as you said Correct. at the beginning, some of what you're trying to do is balance profit making while creating more positive social outcomes. So I guess I have a couple of questions related to that. So first, like, how are you defining affordable or in other words, uh, affordable to whom? And then how does your company ensure that these homes and developments that you're building are affordable, in particular when you're working in countries with higher rates of poverty, uh, like like Brazil, for example? So first, um, we're not defining affordability. We're letting each government, each jurisdiction define it. I, I think it would be wrong for us to come up with a standard definition for affordability. So for instance, in Brazil, uh, affordable has an actual governmental set of definitions. Um, they put it into a scheme. They call it Mina Casa Mina Vida, my, uh, my house, my life. Um, and they have three levels of affordability. They have, you know, how do you qualify as a, as a person wanting to move in to one of these three levels? And they have requirements for those who are building. What is the actual, you know, top cost, top price you can sell uh, units for to, to these qualified people? So they define it, right? In India, it's defined a little bit different. Here in the U.S., you know, we've got, the, we have something we call the FHA loans, right? Which uh, tells you that you, you know, as first time buyers, uh, the homes have to be within a certain price range, right? So there's a lot of government statistics and government uh, schemes and regulations that define 
what affordability means in a particular geography. So for us, it means building into that scheme. We're not trying to argue the scheme. We're just trying to build into it. We like the kinds of schemes that focus on the, the potential uh, resident, things that help them afford a home. We're not really looking for, you know, we're not looking for tax breaks. We're not looking for governmental support. Um, we want to be a private company buying private land and building private homes. And we want to sell them to people who can buy them. So for us, the best schemes is the ones that help the buyer. Brazil is a perfect example of that. Um, in that case, in uh, Mina Casa Mina Vida, um, we are building at level two. That's our, our focus area for most of our work that's happening at the moment. Um, and that caps that home at about 27,000 US dollars to 30,000 on the high end, some, something in that, in that range, uh, equivalent in, in Brazilian uh, currency, Brazilian rias. Um, and that's it. And so everyone, and I mean anyone who is building into Mina Casa Mina Vida level two, um, as they call it, is building the same, or sorry, is selling at the same price point. We are not charging more. Um, so the question is how do we stay profitable when they look so expensive? It turns out that the difference between what we build and what you see others build, which don't look high-end, fancy, green, technologically advanced, the difference is maybe 2% in cost. At the scale that I mentioned earlier, it's around 2%, could be a little less, definitely not much more in terms of cost. The issue is process. The difference between a well-fitted, structurally sound, technologically advanced home is process. When you don't care and you're just slapping it together, you get what you get. If you care, you can make a big difference. The material cost is the same. So it's just really the process of how you build that adds that quality, adds that value. The second part I mentioned is doing things like space optimization. So this has some cost, very small on a per unit basis. You do the space optimization, you take that excess space in terms of build costs, you apply it to really interesting things, the football pitch, the outdoor gym, the running track, uh, bicycle lanes, all of these things that make a difference between you know, a community and a set of housing uh, blocks. This is the difference uh, in how we're doing it. What's most interesting about that, besides the fact that, wow, you know, okay, I can afford this. You know, I, I, I didn't think I could afford such a place. I looked at the others and that's what I thought I could afford. The real difference is that those advances, that slightly higher cost, and then these kinds of services, technological uh, app and platform services after the sale, what they do is they cause the, the speed of sale to be much faster. We're almost five times faster in selling properties than our competitors. So the cost of sale for us is much lower. I'm making up any cost difference just by that. And why is our cost of sale lower? Why are they coming to us faster? Exactly as you said. They looked at this and they went, wow, I'd rather live there than this other place. If I, if I have to choose, I'm choosing the better looking place. And if the price is the same to me, what's the downside? Right? There is no downside. So, so there are more flocking to us. We're selling quite fast in this respect. Um, and that really helps us continue to, to add more services. And then on top of that, that trust model we talked about allows us to open value added services continuously within that in, uh, community. Um, they still have to buy food. They're still going to have transportation. They're still going to need insurance. They're still going to, you know, want to take a, a holiday or go out to a restaurant or whatever. They still do these things. Even at this affordable level, they, they do these things. Um, these people are buying big screen uh, televisions. They have mobile phones. Um, many people moving into our, into our location has a car. Um, they still have expenses, much lower, obviously, uh, from, a, from a, an actual cost standpoint. Um, and so we can build services that are more attuned to their specific needs. Um, that help them in ways that the typical economic approach doesn't help them. 
um, because they're treated as individuals in that respect. In ours, they're treated as part of a community. Um, they feel disconnected in the kinds of places they're living, the favelas in Brazil. Um, now they're coming into a community where they have a say in not just the services we talked about, but a say in their community as a whole. They're forming neighborhood community associations. Um, they don't even know what that means. So we're helping them understand that. We're you know, uh, giving them education. We're letting them become self-aware of what it means. We're giving them a say in things. We're, we're saying, hey, we're about to open another street. We can paint the houses blue. We can paint the houses pink. What do you think? You know, what's your opinion? You decide, right? Oh, your neighbor wants to change the color of their house. Are you going to allow that? Or do you not want to allow that? They've never had that kind of power before. And it, it opens up a whole new type of expression. And from that expression, we can build more services. And from those services, we can start to make more money. And the more we make money on top of that, the more we can build those kinds of communities at a price point that meets their needs, that fits in with the schemes that government sets, and continues to drive profitability to us as a company. Great, thank you. That was an excellent explanation. I was really surprised by that 2% uh, difference in price that you mentioned uh, of like developing these different sorts of uh, communities. That's, that's wild, that's only that is that small. It, it, it is incredible. And in fact, I'll, I'll tell you something else that, you know, we've got the data to support this. When, and in fact, you could even talk to people as part of um, building these kinds of developments, what many do, and, and we're included in this, um, they don't build houses on all the lots. They build houses on many of the lots, maybe most, but not all. And the reason they don't is because some people actually just want to buy the land. And again, we're talking about small pieces. So the land is maybe, you know, 100, or sorry, uh, 10, 10 square meters, right? Like a 10 square meter piece, piece of, of land, right? An infrastructure lot. So, so they're really trying to bu uh, build a small, uh, you know, potentially small land. They're, it's not super expensive. Uh, as hedges against currency fluctuations, it's a great place to store your money, um, in Brazil particularly. And for some investors and speculators, it's, it's nice land. When you talk to many other builders, they'll say, you know, the trouble with these, these sales, these lots, they're called, um, is when we sell them, we end up selling them three times on average. Because here's the process. You sell your, your plot of land uh, in this scheme, you know, that is a Mina Casa, a Mina Vida type community. You sell the land and, and you, uh, they don't pay you right away and they don't get a mortgage on the land. They're allowed to pay you over 10 years, so 120 monthly payments. And you set this up and you have an interest rate and there's some uh, in, uh, um, inflationary uh, metrics and you know, there's a bunch of things that go in there. It's, it's actually more straightforward than it sounds. And they start to pay. And here's what happens. At some point, if they can't continue to pay, you, you take the, the land back. In fact, they've never owned it yet, it, you, you keep it you have to pay back what they've paid you, but you're allowed to keep you know, some portion of that money as a loss fee. And what these builders have been telling us is, you know, on average, they end up selling that same plot of land three times over. Because you know, the first one lasts so long and doesn't. Then I gotta sell it again, and then I gotta sell it again. And that has costs implicated all by itself. We're not finding that problem at all. And we're not finding that because we're able to, the people that are coming to buy from us um, are, are seeing a higher value on that land and are willing to you know, put more of their own money into it. So it secures that and we're, we're not losing that, that, uh, that time that, where we have to resell it and resell it again. So it's really interesting to kind of watch. And, and you ask yourself, well, why aren't these other builders doing this? Well, I mean, I guess they never thought about it and they can't believe that we've got a, a process that makes it not much more expensive. For us, building the infrastructure, the electric, the water access, the road beds, you know, again, it's not much more money to do all of this. And we can drive value gains on that land, which creates an economic opportunity for a whole bunch of people. I, I think it's, it's, it's amazing we haven't seen more of it in the past, but you know, now, now we can see it and others will start to copy. Yeah, I hope so.
So we're running a little bit low on time, so I just want to get to this last sort of bit of uh, the last, last sort of uh, topic that I wanted to cover. So you've mentioned the development that y'all are working on in Northeast Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that this is rather large development, apparently can, it is meant to house more than 60,000 residents, which is like a huge number of people. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit more uh, about this project? Well, so in the Northeast of Brazil, I mean, there's really, it's, there's really, it's three separate uh, projects. Two are in Sierra State, one on either side of Fortaleza, and then one in uh, Rio Grande do Norte. Um, the one in Rio Grande do Norte is in Natal, which is uh, a, a well-known city. Um, and the uh, other two we call uh, Smart City Laguna. It's uh, just uh, north, uh, northeast of uh, Fortaleza and uh, Smart City Aqueras, which is just on the, uh, on the south side. Um, so together, it's about 60,000. So I just want to make sure that, that that's clear. So for us, the Northeast does represent that, that large magnitude, but it's really three, uh, three separate uh, communities. Laguna was our first. Um, we're well on our way. Families have been moving in. Home sales are, are swift. Uh, land plots are being sold. Um, and it just continues to grow and, and, uh, and develop. Um, Natal uh, started uh, later. Um, here, we, and no one's moved in yet. The infrastructure is done and home, uh, set, home building is starting. And uh, Akira's were just starting uh, breaking ground. Great. So uh, with, with your developments, you know, housing so many people, uh, you know, that, that's, that's not like a, that's, that's a, 60,000 people in total spread across these three developments is, is pretty, it's a pretty big number of people. So I'm curious how your company interacts with uh, local officials to make sure that your developments sort of fit into the grander scheme that they have uh, or grander vision that they have for urban development in the area. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, we're, we try to, to be, to focus it like this. We, we, we say we're, you know, private builder, private company, uh, building on uh, land we own. So, you know, we do private lands uh, buys. Um, we will work with governments in terms of, of uh, creative ways of looking at land acquisition. Um, India, that's uh, particularly uh, important. Brazil, maybe not as much, um, just again, uh, due to cultural, uh, you know, on, on, on land ownership, uh, on, on how land ownership kind of works. Um, which means, though, with private uh, buying and, and private land, um, we don't need to spend a lot of time working with, with government. Um, we're, we're not trying, again, to create trouble. We're not trying to look for handouts or a particular benefit. We're really trying to recognize that we want to fill a gap. And if you tell us what the rules are, we're very happy uh, to follow them. So certainly, we have to follow all the local building codes and building regulations where we think that there are some challenges. We're willing to work with the local authorities to, uh, uh, to overcome those challenges uh, in terms of build. You know, again, like we can talk about the roads as an example, they weren't used to seeing the, the way we were gonna build our road. At first, they weren't sure if that was gonna be compliant to their, uh, their building codes and regulations. You know, you spend time with them, showing them, letting them get involved. And, and appreciating, and we can kind of see uh, how that goes, and, and, and hopefully in the end they agree. In this case, of course, they did. Uh, they did agree, and, and it was fine. Um, I mentioned the electric as an example. You know, bearing them made the most sense for all kinds of reasons, um, but they, they just weren't ready for that. We don't need to fight it. We don't need to make a big issue. We'd rather have the cordial relationship with them and recognize that Hey, they've got their job to do, and we've got our job to do. And if we can, you know, work well together, then we'll find the options that work. And where we can't find the right compromises, it's okay. You know, we'll we'll follow the rules, and and we're good with that. Um, we're in terms of the of the of the more macro policy environments. Um, for us, it's it's really just listening, you know, and and appreciating that they have a huge housing deficit and that we want to build high quality communities. And once we've been able to show them exactly what those communities look like and, and what quality means and, and uh, you know, what smart means, all the things we've talked about over the last you know, 40 or so minutes, they seem pretty uh, content 
that what we're doing doesn't need a huge amount of oversight. Um, we're not looking, you know, that we're, we're not asking them for any kind of changes in regulation or policy. And so they feel like, hey, here's a company that wants to follow the rules, hire Brazilians, um, build quality for the people that need it, and, uh, and, and operate a successful company. So far, we've been able to show that's exactly what we're doing. And we get the kind of support that one would expect uh, any business to get who wants to be a good citizen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Those are all the questions that, that I prepared for you. So I guess before we part ways, are there any like last thoughts that you'd like to, to leave the audience? Um, I guess maybe the, uh, the last uh, thought I would just say is, um, you know, for us, it's not just about the smart city. It is about affordability. Um, according to the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, 1.6 billion people live in, in inadequate, unsafe, and overcrowded housing. And we think that through the things we've discussed here, we, we hope to have an impact on some percentage of them. Um, we can't solve it for all 1.6 billion, but we certainly won't stop uh, trying but we think if we, this model works the way we say it does and, and, uh, and believe it is, then we'll find other builders following something uh, similar. And maybe we can uh, actually affect that 1.6 billion and get them into not just a roof over their head, but a quality, uh, inclusive, uh, imp uh, positively impactful environment in which they can thrive. That's, that's probably the best takeaway I can leave with. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Planet Smart City and their ongoing projects, you can visit their website at www.planetsmartcity.com. We'll see you next time. The Future Cities Podcast is an outreach effort brought to you by the Urban Resilience to Extremes Sustainability Research Network, or UREX as we usually refer to it. To learn more about UREX, visit www.sustainability.asu.edu forward slash urban resilience. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at futurecitiespodcast at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at futurecitiespod. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.